Okay, next Sunday. Yes. Very good. Um, just FYI, I will not be here next Sunday, so when the cat's away, the mice will play. Uh, Sean's going to be preaching for me. I, I get, get to be able to go up and visit a church with my oldest son, and he, he requested that I just come and feel it out with him. And so I think that that's something as a dad that I would love to be able to do, and so I'm just going to do it. And Sean is going to cover for me, and the rest of you guys are going to be just fine. Okay. Uh, May 26th, so in two weeks, we're going to hold a new members class at 9 o'clock in the morning. There's a couple uh, that has requested um, they want to join the church. And um, so May 26th at 9 o'clock, if there's any of you here that also want to join or would like to consider joining, we're going to meet over in the parish house in two weeks. That's May 26th from 9 to 10 o'clock, and anyone is welcome to join us at that time. If you have any questions, just see me. Uh, one other thing, too, is we're going through these Bible verses. I know you guys are probably getting tired of me doing this every week, but I'm going to keep doing it every week. Okay. What's our mem what was our memory verse for this past week, guys? It was really easy. No, that was, that, was, that was last week, not my birthday. Aha, very good. Yeah, Jeremiah, didn't you steal your thunder?
when was the when did when was this proposal? Oh, 20, April twenty sixth, my birthday. Oh, 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 do you have a date set for the wedding? Okay, all right. Not yet. Oh. Excellent. Congratulations. Yes, Doug's mom is here in the back. <laughs> and uh, it's Derek's dad, is that right, Dennis? Yes, my father. Yes, okay. Uh, so, do I have to stand? <laughs>
quick to wander. And uh, if we are honest with ourselves, and it doesn't do any good to lie, we do find our hearts uh, near constantly drawn away. And we want, as the impulse of our spirits and souls and very beings, we want the impulse to be coming back to you every single day, coming back to the cross, the ground of our salvation, coming back to that place where you made us right with, uh, where, where your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, made us right with Holy God. Something that is impossible to do unless you do it. And we're thankful. We're so very thankful. We, we're brought into the awe of the moment that the scriptures talk about where Jesus comes up before your throne and he's given all authority. Mm -hmm. All authority over the entire world. Yes. And that includes me right now. And that includes each and every one of these brothers and sisters that have come and have claimed your name. They have come into that authority and that authority that has saved us primarily and dramatically has taken us out of the kingdom of darkness, out of this world of hopelessness, futility, despair, that what we're seeing rear its head more and more every single day. And you've brought us into life and hope and peace and purpose. So we're so very grateful for that. Help us to always keep coming back to you, back to the cross, over and over. Every single day we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us greet one another. Okay, uh, Luke chapter 23, verses 32 through 43. Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place which is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him vinegar, and saying, If you were the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingly power. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It's a strange place for someone to recognize that Jesus is coming in his kingdom and kingly power. Right? And Jesus said, Today you will be with me. He said, Remember me, right? Yeah. Uh, kids, if I can have you guys come forward. We're going to talk about the Lord remembering us. Uh, so, do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. It comes from these words from the thief on the cross. So, we're used to kind of singing this all peppy. But it comes from a place of just dire agony and the, the brink of death, but it's the same thing when, when we look to Jesus and say Jesus, remember me, he comes back and he says to us, yes. Absolutely. So, let us sing it together, do Lord, and then we're going to go into um, I got a home in Gorland, and then I took Jesus as my Savior. We're just going to have fun with it, alright? Awesome. You guys ready? Thank you, Lord. Do Lord, just remember me.
come before the Lord in prayer together if there's anything that's weighing on your heart, um, whether it's a matter of uh, concern or praise, bring it out before the Lord. He loves to hear the prayers of his children. He loves to not just hear, he loves to answer. And so we come to him expecting him to answer. I, again, in his sovereignty, he might say no or he might say wait. But, you know, when we come to our dads or moms as kids, we understand that they might say no and they might say wait, but usually we come expecting them to say yes, right? That's the same thing. When we come to our Heavenly Father, we need to come expecting that He'll say yes. So let's do that. Heavenly Father, we just want to come before you as your, <clears throat> indeed, your sons and daughters, your dearly loved children. And we want to come to you with expectant hearts and expectant minds and expectant words. We want to see your kingdom come in greater fullness here and now. We, um, I confess, this week I have struggled with discouragement. Looking at everything that's going on in the world and what's recently happened with like the United Methodist Church. And it kind of just started to hit me this week. And, um, and so I need your encouragement as well. Um, that we can still expect that you will do great works even when it looks like the enemy is just having a heyday. Uh, even within the congregations of those that claim your name, um, you are still on the throne and your kingdom is still going to come in its fullness in your good time and your kingdom is going to come in measured ways through each of us as we walk forward in obedience to your will. And so we want to change our minds. It's okay to be discouraged. It's okay to struggle. I understand that. It's also okay to be renewed. And that's one of our reasons why we come here, Lord. And I know I need to be renewed. And I'm pretty darn sure that there's others here that need to be renewed as well. So strengthen and empower us by your Holy Spirit to walk forward with renewed strength into your will in Jesus' name. Dear God, I, I pray for my Aunt Sharon, who's in the hospital again, Lord. And, uh, please uh, help her breathe, Lord. Uh, she's been fighting that for quite a while. And, uh, please ease, ease her breathing, Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, I thank you for the beautiful display of the northern lights that we had. And yes. I know that many times um, people farther north than us get to see those, but I just I thank you for that display that was um, visible to so many people that don't just normally get to see it. And so I thank you for that and for the beautiful creation, for your, your love and beauty, Lord, and your power, your awesomeness. I think of the verses in the Bible that say the heavens declare the glory of God and that they pour forth your praise. God. And so we just we just step back and just um, we are in awe of that. We praise you for your creation that you have given us. But most of all, we praise you for you who are the creator. We will not worship your creation. We will worship you. Yeah. Yes. But yes, it was pretty cool. <laughs> Lord, you're also the great physician, and I just pray for Norma Iverson's son, Bruce, who's in the hospital mm -hmm. uh, today, and that you would heal him if it be your will. I pray that you be with Norma as she waits for um, word on how he's doing. I pray that you um, strengthen her and comfort her, and that um, she will lean on you during this time. I also want to pray for my uh, little boy Judah, who's having some chest pains, uh, continuing this morning. We don't know why. Just pray that you would uh, relieve him of this pain that he's struggling with. In Jesus' name. First, for all of those of us who have lost our moms, um, and know that you have them. Um, but all the moms before them, and before them, and before them. All the moms that welcomed us, carried us, and welcomed us, we wouldn't be here today without 
the lineage of moms and dads. And we are so blessed to be here today to worship in your house. Lord, I just want to bring before you this morning those of us that have elder family members um, as we watch uh, just what the years do to these imperfect bodies that we love in, Lord, and um, watch them struggle with the, the effects of that. We just place that before you, Lord, and ask that you would keep them safe and that you would help us also to, to know what our role needs to be, what, what help we need to provide. And at the other end of the spectrum, Lord, also I lift up those of us that have uh, children that are uh, seeking to make their way in the world and, and yes. to discover what your purpose is for them uh, in their own lives, Lord, as, uh, as our adult children. Just to <laughs> be with them and guide them as well. Lord, Psalm 19, 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And Lord, two nights ago, uh, over our house here in Lake Bay, there were formations that looked like angels that we took pictures of. They were glorious. Mm -hmm. And my family, my, my daughter and my granddaughter were out going, oh, oh, mm -hmm. oh, look at how, look at, look at, it's just got to be God. It's just, mm -hmm. look at the angels. And Lord, I, my kids don't. My daughter doesn't talk like that normally, mm -hmm. but Lord, there was a there was an excitement about mm -hmm. your handiwork, and Lord, I just thank you for refreshing of hearts mm -hmm. and refreshing of minds, mm -hmm. and Lord, turning yes. their thoughts towards your Majesty and your glory. Yes. And I thank you for that, Jesus. Yes. Amen. And let us close together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. I can call forward the ushers at this time to receive the offer.
walking through various passages in the New Testament that help us understand more about our task um, and to hopefully equip us better in the task that lies before each and every one of us, beginning here, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay, you're probably all familiar with these verses are commonly referred to as the Great Commission, and rightly so. It comes at the close of this gospel, which introduced us to and outlined the high points of, at least from Matthew's perspective, the life of Jesus, climaxing in his crucifixion. Uh, the moment for which he came, yes, though it was the moment as well of utter disillusionment, right? We mustn't miss what that might have looked like and felt like and seemed like at the moment when it happened because how can who we all thought was the Messiah be so brutally cut off by the very oppressions he was supposed to free us from. Not realizing that right then and there he was actually freeing us from the greatest oppressor of all we let us sink in, sin and damnation, and culminating in the resurrection, the moment that blew their minds and that blew open the gospel of the world. And then this resurrected Christ right here issues our marching orders. If this is true, the cross and empty tomb, then we've got a mission to do. We are now his hands and feet and mouth. What is it that he is pushing us to do? And you'll notice, by the way, our marching orders are not to make converts. We'd expect that and too often we think that, but it's not. Too often what we promote as churches is to get as many people as we can to make a profession of faith, and that's it. If we can just get people to say a certain prayer, ask Jesus into their heart, the way it was often said in my younger years, then we've done our job, right? Not to develop. Pat on the back, moving on. The largest Protestant denomination here in the States explicitly emphasizes and pushes tallying up the numbers from each of its member churches, how many professions of faith were received, and how many baptisms were performed as the measure of growth and faithfulness of whether you're doing a good job or whether you're underperforming. But our marching orders are not to make converts. It's to make disciples. disciples. Yes. That's the one strictly technical actual command in the Great Commission. And a disciple, by the way, is just a learner. That's what the word means in the Greek. But what that meant... In that day and age, and we see it modeled for us especially clearly in the Gospels. Okay, I'm going to give it to you in three, a series of three parts. And I'm going to repeat it several times in the sermon so that you get it. So you're going to want to know, what is a disciple? If we're supposed to make disciples, we see it in the Gospels. Yes, it's a learner, but when we see what that means in the Gospels, it's somebody who follows, learns from, comes like the master. That's what a disciple does. That's who a disciple is. Someone who follows, learns from, and becomes like the master. That's what it's all about. That's our mission. Those are our marching orders. Not evangelism. All right, then why on earth are we having a mini-series on evangelism? And why are we starting it off with this particular
particular passage? Okay, good question. And some might think, and even proclaim it as such, often ignoring and skewing a whole lot of other vitally necessary things that our marching orders are all about, huh? love. Jesus is all about love, and we're supposed to be all about love, though so often I'm thinking of the broader American church. Much of what is uh, uh, tanking now on, on core, both doctrinal and ethical matters, all the while justifying their decisions based upon Jesus' demand that we love, though we twist it now to mean love as we define it, rather than how he defines it. And it is very true. We're supposed to be all about love. Jesus himself issued this new commandment, John 13, 34 and 35, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. Oh, <laughs> disciples. If you love one another, you notice that? Love is the principal marker of being a disciple that we grow into as we are teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, Matthew 28, verse 20. So yes, love is primary. But it's not all. We can't be a true disciple of Jesus if we don't have love, if we don't walk in love, if we don't begin to walk in love more and more. But there's more to being a disciple than just showing love, or you might say, Showing the love of Christ, love as Christ both demonstrates it and demands it, encapsulates oh so much more than we might think or assume is love. Because it's not all about love, per se. Again, noting my qualification, right? It is, but it isn't. It's all about making disciples. Okay, and it's not about activism or making changes in our culture or political system or governmental decisions or even issues of justice in society, which I use specifically as a phrase so as not to confuse social justice or the social justice movement or, or social justice warriors, which so often skew God's concerns with their own ideas, priorities, and agenda with God's genuine concern for the outworking of and our advocacy for actual justice in society. God says, and we need to hear it clearly and not only hear it, but do it. He says to the prophet Amos, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, Amos 5, 21 to 24, I hate I despise all of your religious activities, even your worship. He says this, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Whoa. But pursuing justice in our society, these aren't our marching orders here either, are they? No, it's still making disciples, nothing else. But part of making these disciples is teaching them, once again, to observe all that I have commanded you, verse 20. So it's part of it, but only part. We've got to keep our eyes clearly on what the focus, the focus of our orders is, and that focus is make disciples. Again, that is those who will, what are they? Follow, learn from, and don't stop there. Become like, that's the end goal, the master. But that whole process, beginning with the decision to begin to follow, all begins with evangelism. Because you can't make a disciple without first making a convert. And that's why we're here. That's why we're beginning our mini-series on evangelism 
with the Great Commission because if telling others about Jesus and inviting others to follow Jesus is necessarily implied in our marching orders. In fact, it is the first step as we begin to step out. The first step, yes. But like I said, not the end goal. It's important to keep those two things in mind because we too often swing the pendulum too far one way or the other. We're all about leading people to Christ and we end there. Or we're all about discipleship and we ignore evangelism. But it's got to be both. You're bringing both ends back to the middle, if I can state it again. Our marching orders are to make disciples, not evangelism. But disciple making begins with evangelism. It's inherent in the Great Commission, okay? But this central mission, this single and singular command, is surrounded in these verses by a series of four alls. Four alls that truly dominate the passage and that drive us, that guide us, that encourage us in the task at hand. And those four alls are, first, all authority, second, all nations, third, all that I have commanded you, and fourth, all ways, or more literally, it's all the days, so it's even more pronounced in the Greek, two of which form the theological background, that is the outer frames, the all authority and the all ways, right? And two of which are the practical outworking, the inner core, all nations and all that I have commanded you. The outer two are the theological truths that lie behind and undergird and propel the mission itself. The inner two are the mission. Okay, so I want to walk through these four alls. And I'm going to walk through these four alls in four C's. You know, pastors, uh, preachers are often accused of you know, doing things like this. And I'm going to do it with reckless abandon. <laughs> okay, so first, the cause of the mission. And that cause, that spur, that grounding and driving truth is all authority. Verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. There it is. And I want you to notice it's all authority that comes from, excuse me, that comes at this moment, this pivotal moment, and that comes from this pivotal moment. Moment. Where are we at in this moment? Jesus has just been crucified and has now been resurrected. So the moment that sparks this mission of making disciples, beginning with evangelism, that is the cause of this mission. That's the crucified, resurrected, and soon to be ascended. Lord, if this happened, then this must happen, right? And when we think of this all authority, the issues here, and I'm going to list them by three S's. I just can't help myself. <laughs> all right. I, uh, don't worry, I won't make a habit of it. But it's just, they came so easily. Sovereignty, Savior, and success. Okay, the number one issue of this all authority is that he is sovereign because it's not just some authority. It's not even a lot of authority. It's all authority, and that is a big statement, and it's a big statement that points us back to Daniel chapter 7, what we used in our call of worship. This is where our Lord's words are drawn from as an echo heard across the centuries. An echo that shatters the long hold of night, that smothers us all in its stifling grip of the hopelessness and the oppression that so stubbornly reign. But there's a new king that reigns in this moment, prophesied in Daniel 7, 
Realize in Matthew 28, I want to just read verses 13 and 14. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Now those words come at the climax of a vision. We didn't read the whole thing in the call of worship, but if you were to go back and read the entirety, it comes at the climax of a vision of the empires of the world. Empires that morph from one vicious beast to another. Right? That throws us to Revelation, but that's a whole other discussion. And they all have their authority and dominion for a time under God's sovereign hand. But the time will come when a truly human rule, that's uh, what Son of Man refers to, but in the best that that means, one also, however, with clearly divine prerogatives. And how do you put those things together? Jesus shows us. They couldn't at that time. They just had to wonder. Will be given absolute and everlasting Dominion, where the evil and destruction of the world's authority will itself be trumped and overturned. And it happens at the moment in which it is given to him by the one on the throne. And the focus of that moment, when it is given, is right now. Right. Now, the Son of Man, which is Jesus' favorite pet term for himself, evidently stemming from Daniel 7. This Son of Man, crucified and resurrected, all authority in the universe, it says, is given to me. And that, by the way, is the emphasis in the Greek, is that it has been given in this moment. It is now his possession. Okay, follow up, and also the inherent issue is that he is the Savior. Right? As we saw from Daniel 7, which Jesus is beginning to take up right here. All the peoples and nations of the world, right, which leads us into the all nations, right, that we'll be looking at as well, in that vision will gather around and worship him in right relationship with him as part of his universal and unending kingdom. What that means is that in this moment, when Jesus issues this great commission, he's not only sovereign, but he's also savior of the world. The savior from all the futilities and evils of this world. Do you struggle with that? I mentioned in prayer that I was struggling with that this week. There's a nagging frustration of living in this world plagued by death and decline and dysfunction and dissatisfaction when we know and we long for something more, something better, something lasting. And there's a savior too from all the destructive, let's be honest with ourselves again, bent and shame and guilt of personal sin. Do you struggle with that? Oh, yeah. We all do. One who died for our sins so that we don't have to. And is raised from the dead so that you can too. This is good news. This is hope. This is cause. But there's more. Third issue of this all authority that Jesus possesses and that Jesus exercises through us. Oh, there's a lot there. I don't have time to explore. Is that just centering in on this particular passage is that we will have, third S, success. Yes. If he's the one with all authority, then that means there will be gospel success. And the success is not up to me. I am the vessel. I am the means. But he is the actor. And he is the effect. And he will have his effect. This is freeing, by the way, for me personally. Hopefully it's freeing for you as well. Because it's not a fruitless endeavor. 
He does not send us out on a fruitless endeavor. Whomever the Lord chooses to save, to bring into his kingdom, through the faithful efforts of you and me, he will indeed save. This is one of the encouragements of his sovereignty tied to his salvation in our lives. And I would just say, let us walk out in that confidence, even though, speaking from personal, undoubtedly daunted. I'm just as scared as the rest of you. Thank you. And the task does seem to be, as we go every single day down this road, ever more daunting. But we are his vessels of his authority to save, and he will save. And so we can go out there, wherever the out there might be, knowing that his kingdom, his authority will take root and flourish through me as I am obedient to my marching orders, because the results aren't up to me, they're up to him. And he's got all the power to back it up and make it happen, even though it's not always in the way or at the time that I might choose. But because from the very get-go, what sets the tone, what has the list, is that all authority belongs to him. And praise the Lord for that. Okay, second. I got four points, so I can't stay too long in each one. And you will thank me later. <laughs> Second, you know, Sean can clean up all my messes next time. <laughs> <laughs> Second, the confines of the mission. Okay, strange. Or you could call it so that it doesn't sound at all restrictive. I just needed a C word. The scope of the mission, that almost sounds like a C word, but... But the breadth of scope, those expansive confines, is all nations. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now up to this point, Jesus' ministry and the ministry of his disciples was almost exclusively kept to the environs of Israel. But now right here, he explicitly explodes that focus. For now that he has been raised from the dead and has received universal authority, the announcement of his kingship and salvation. Okay, we'll explore more of that as we go down. And the response that it must engender must go to the world. And this is that moment. And that moment is ours. And to get us there, he explicitly says, as the verse says, go. Now, as I stated already, there is only one true command in this summary charge, and that is the command to make disciples. Go is actually a participle that carries an imperatival force secondary to the main thrust for all you grammar and syn syntax nerds out there. But the way our Lord introduces us to that command lets us know right up front that he expects a fundamentally outward focus to our ministry. If we, if we claim to believe in the Great Commission, if we want to obey the Great Commission, we cannot remain inwardly focused, and we can't keep ourselves insular. Amen. We've got to stretch ourselves, to push against those comfortable boundaries we like to erect. We've got to constantly be seeking to reach out. So it shouldn't go without saying, but you can't go if you're simply content with the status quo. You can't be going if you're content with staying put and standing still. Okay, but you might ask, what does that mean for us as a church? Or for me as an individual believer? Okay, certainly, baseline, 
bottom shelf issue. Like J. Vernon McGee used to say, you, you put the cookies on the bottom shelf where the children can reach them. <laughs> so these are your cookies. We've got to be involved in world missions. We simply do. In God's mission work into all nations and maybe even seriously consider being that missionary yourself. We have lost sight of that, praise God, for like John and Jen Myers when they first came and they said we feel called to go to the middle of the jungles in Papua New Guinea with our little kids. Far away from any medical care. Far, you know, who knows what we're going to eat and the food really is. Hmm. And they went. Seriously, think. Poppy, maybe some of Judah. Uh, Kathy, uh, you're never too old to be that. If the Lord lays it on your heart, pick it up and go. Um, but in some way, we've got to be involved. If we're involved in the Great Commission, you've got, we have got to be involved with world missions. And I am so very grateful that as a church, we are. Yes. At least we are now. Right? Because when I was first called the pastor here, we weren't supporting any, either gospel or world missions at all. Which was one clear indicator that we lost sight of this foundational call. Since then, however, as you all well know, we've become a part of supporting several, and some of these from the ground up, such that we are seeing and participating in his gospel work going out into the farthest reaches of all nations. And that is awesome. Yes. But we can't just sit back and write checks mm -hmm. and pray for over there. Okay. Nor can we just be involved in world mission and think that we're off the hook. Because world missions also begins right here because the nations of the world are already right here. I'll think, I'm just going to put some little thought nuggets out there. Think of the First Nations peoples that we have so horribly failed in our history. The Lord brought missionaries over to this continent. There were some small successes, but we, by and large, horribly failed. We don't have to continue to fail. We have nations all around us. We might begin thinking and praying, how can we maybe begin to reach out with Jesus? And, and I've had have some experience with working with a missionary who was called to the Yakma peoples, and he didn't go in there. He felt called by God to, to come back and stay. That was the first thing. And then when he stayed, he didn't preach the gospel. He put roofs on houses. He started serving for years and years. Oh, and then, you know, doing stuff with the kids. And then that, year after year after year of showing Jesus sticking around, that they were finally able to hear about mm -hmm. Jesus. And there's now a church planted mm -hmm. in the Yakimas, mm -hmm. by the Yakimas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how we have so horribly failed, we have nations all around us. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Also, think of all the nationalities, frankly, that are represented not just in the broader United States, but also right here in our midst. I mean, we've got Heinz 57, like me and Judah, for example, what my dad's age used to call us genealogical mutts. <laughs> uh, so we've got English folk, right? Yeah. We, we've got, well, the Murphys aren't here, but if they were, they're Irish. Not, not, hardly a more Irish name than the Murphys. Oh, Sean, yeah. There you go. Very good. Uh, we've got some now, Norma. Uh, I was hoping that she was going to be here because I was going to pick on her. Norwegian. And German. I grew up in a Norwegian town, and it's you know one of the the placards in the, in the 
the Scandinavian bakery was, Lord, it's hard to be humble in your Norwegian. Yeah. <laughs> we got, uh, they're not here either. I was hoping the Gazabats would be here, but that's French. It's not pronounced Gazabat in the French, by the way. What's milk on? Yeah, oh, that's <laughs> right. Uh, we've got Nigerian, even, right, my wife. Uh, we've got Filipina. Yes, very good. Uh, Misael sometimes comes, so that's South American, Hispanic, and Indian. We got all, you know, fill in the blank. Oh, yes? Swedish. Swedish and Polish. Very good. See, yeah. these are all the nations of, of, and don't forget the Scotch Irish. That's right. Very good. Yep, yeah, we got all sorts and colors and kinds. Praise God that He saved us. We are grateful recipients of this mission. And let that mission continue, right? Among us and through us. So don't forget, hey, we are part of these all nations. And also, this might sound a little controversial, that's okay. I'm here to step on toes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because the nations of the world are also coming to and through mm -hmm. yeah. our borders well, yes. themselves. So think about all of the immigrants, and I'm going to say legal and illegal. Because regardless of what you think about our immigration policy, and there is certainly need for great reform in that department. Okay, now we can set that entire thing aside. The issue for us as Christians now is that whoever is here is now, guess what? Part of our mission, our marching orders to make disciples of the hordes from all nations that are breaking through our borders. Again, policy is another issue. What is our marching orders as Christians? Okay, keep that focus first. And don't forget also that all nations includes or even starts with our own family. Yes. With raising our children in the faith to truly own the faith as their own. Our family is our first mission field. We mustn't stop there nor get confined there because God's confines is the whole world. Okay, third, the content of the mission. That's made clear for us in verse 20, the content. So the cause of the mission, the confines of the mission, the content of the mission. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So the content of our mission is that all that I have commanded you, not just some, and not pick and choose, which has become all too common, but all. Picking up from the previous verse and the central command, this is the process by which disciples are made. Now, it involves three supporting participles that surround and explore what that central command, make disciples, means and entails. These three participles are the how, how you go about doing this one main thing. And the order is important. Let me just pick up you know, uh, verse 19 into verse 20, just to read, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, etc., right? They surround and explore what that central command of making disciples actually means and entails. These are the how we go about doing this one main thing. And the order is important. It entails going baptizing, and teaching. Teaching here, I would say, being the main emphasis because it, well, it has the repetition of this all, right? The four alls that punctuate it. The all is attached to the teaching aspect, so I think the emphasis is there. But going, right, first is that evangelistic impulse because first you've got to get up and go, as we looked at already. You've got to actually engage with other people who are out there, wherever that means, who aren't yet Christians. That's a given. But one that we need to 
you often skip or ignore, and one that we will be emphasizing in our mini-series together. Next, baptism. Baptism actually marks our entry into the faith. It is not the mark of maturity. After a long process of teaching, that's what we've tended to make it. It precedes all that. It's the mark of entry. That's why it's noted as the first aspect on the discipleship journey, baptism into, that's the more typical meaning of the Greek preposition there, Full identification with the name, singular, one, of the three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What a potent declaration of the both truth and unfathomable mystery of the Trinity that Christ has sort of drops for us. But making disciples is really the long and patient process of teaching by word and example, the commands that our Lord has given to us, and we are called to teach them all. And not just teaching to fill our heads, which does no good as an end game. Remember Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only what? The one who does the will of my Father who is in Heaven. So not just teach them in order to know them. You can stand before the throne with your head chock full of stuff. And if he says those words to you, all that stuff did you absolutely know. Teach them. Not in order to know them. Teach them in order to keep them. That's the word there, literally. Otherwise, it's usually rendered observe or obey. <clears throat> but it is careful. It is regular. It is extended. If I can use an analogy, any of you bricklayers out there, it is brick upon brick. And not leaving any bricks out. Right? That's the process of making disciples. But again, you might ask, what does that mean? How, how do we go about making disciples by teaching all these things? Well, certainly... It must begin, maybe, with the importance of feeding, daily feeding yourself on the Word of God. Because in order to make disciples, you've got to be a disciple. That is one who follows, learns from, and becomes like the Master. So if we are not, each of us, being sustained by personal devotion to the Lord in Scripture and in prayer, then our own discipleship journey will undoubtedly suffer because a disciple is not made only once a week. That's right. But also as a church, in what we teach from the pulpit or in our classrooms and home groups, etc., do we have this as our goal? For all who are affiliated with us here to make disciples to see Jesus formed in each other. Is that our priority? This speaks also to the importance of instruction in the whole counsel of God, that what is spoken from this pulpit and what we come to hear from the pulpit is not simply some inspiring message on any number of topics. I mean, that's all too common in American churches. Careful, steady, plotting, expository preacher is hardly ever done. But what you end up then with is a shallow Christianity churning out a faith that won't stand up under trials or under pressures and thus fall away. Is that what we want? No. Then stop doing what you're doing. Or we camp out on our favorite verses or our favorite subjects and end up with a lopsided Christianity, churning out deficient or deformed disciples who portray a deformed image of Christ. Oh, he says, teaching them all that I have commanded you. And let us not forget our children once again. 
is our primary mission in raising our own kids that of making disciples. If not, we have lost our vision. How many Christian parents, and I will just throw that out there, pretty sure I know what the answer is, and it's close to zero. How many Christian parents have that as their main goal in all that they are doing with and for their kids? How many Christian parents have that to make disciples as their main goal in all that they are doing with and for their kids? Or is it rather to have them get a good education, to get ahead in life, and to live comfortably? If you can have a better life than I had, then I've done my job wrong. You have failed in your mission. Those other things, they may be fine, but if so, they are far down the totem pole. And if that's our focus and goal, then I, again, I, we are far off base. As I said, our family is our first mission field. Let us never miss that. And then whomever else we might engage with the gospel to begin this journey with Jesus. We, we've got to get them plugged into this process of sustained teaching in the context especially of a community of faith. That's why church is so important. This is making disciples. Because it's not enough to make connections. Or even converts. We've got to make disciples. And that is long, hard work. Which is why so many probably avoid it. And fourth, the comfort of the mission. The comfort of the mission. And that is Christ's presence with us. Verse 20 concludes, And behold, I am with you all ways to the end of the age. Again, it's literally all the days. It's the promise of his perpetual presence with each and every one of us from that moment and through all our moments, all this stuff that we got to go through until that eternal new day dawns when he will dwell with us and us with him in complete and unhindered glory forever. Come Lord Jesus. But that's the supreme consolation that we so earnestly yearn for, and it is a longing that will be fulfilled. But the comfort even now is that I am with you always. This is the backside, as I sort of mentioned at the beginning, this is the backside of that outer frame, right? Begun with all authority from which the king commissions us with our marching orders, but now also says, this and what a difference it makes if our commander in chief with the big guns not only says, Not only do I send you, but I am going with you. Right? Not only does he possess all authority, but he takes that authority and walks. With it, with us. Now that changes things. How does he go with us, you might ask? Okay. Didn't he ascend to the right hand of the Father? Yes. But remember, before he went to the cross, when he had his last heart to heart with his disciples, he told them this. This is John 14. Did I not? There's John 14. I flagged it somewhere. Not there. No. There it is. John 14. John 14, verses 16 to 18, it says this, And I will ask the Father, Jesus says, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. This. So here, behold, I am with you always. This is the presence of Jesus by his Holy Spirit, indwelling and empowering each and every one of us who
who have given our hearts and lives to Him. And because of this, we can face anything that faces us. Is it persecution or opposition? Jesus is with you. Is it sin or temptation? Jesus is with me. Is it loneliness or depression? Jesus is with me. Is it inadequacy or anxiety? Jesus is with me. Is it, yes, an opportunity for the gospel? Yes, Jesus is with me there and then too. And that changes everything. And then in Acts chapter 1, where it opens up, where Jesus does in fact ascend into heaven, but before he does, he says this, Acts 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The Holy Spirit is that continually indwelling and empowering presence of Jesus. And that is our continual comfort as we go out on mission, as we set out to make disciples, starting with that scary word, yep, evangelism. We do not go alone. He is always with us. With his power to witness and with his power to So this is our mission. These are our marching orders subsumed for mnemonic purposes under five C's. And you said, wait a minute, I thought there were only four. There are only four. I'm adding a fifth. <laughs> Number one, the cause of the mission, that's the all authority. The confines of our mission, that's all nation. The content of our mission, that's all that I have commanded you. And the comfort of our mission, I am with you always, all surrounding, right? The central fifth core of the mission make disciples those who will what? follow learn from and become like the master that is our personal end goal and that is our end goal for everyone and as I've mentioned making disciples begins with making converts Discipleship begins with evangelism. These are our marching orders. Let us actively and intentionally be about our mission. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words. They do scare us, however. Um, and that's okay. Pour out your spirit in a more abundant way into and through each of our lives, Lord, that we might, uh, with greater boldness, joy, and effectiveness proclaim your kingship and invite into your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. We're going to close with a couple more bluegrass gospel songs. When Jesus beckons me home, and this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. And we got work to do while we're passing through, that's for sure. Please stand. <laughs>
invite the two tambourinists to come forward. They're going to help us with this last one. Kathy, yeah. Heidi, oh, we yeah. need help up here with a little bit loud noise. Oh, this word is not my home. I'm going to try to